pin yourself and take it away. Hey, thank you, Donna. Yes, the recording should be going. So I'm super excited to um, introduce Sarah Augustine. I'm so glad she's joining the CTA community tonight. During Lent 2022, Call to Action members met virtually to discuss Sarah Augustine's book, The Land is Not Empty, Following Jesus and Dismantling the Doctrine of Discovery. This book discussion was the first action planned by CTA's Indigenous Solidarity Collective, which is a new working group that emerged from our regeneration program, which is our young adult program. So I want to thank the Indigenous Solidarity Collective for their work and their persistence in pushing CTA on the issue of Indigenous rights, justice, and healing, and also for pushing Sarah Augustine's work to the forefront. They loved reading and discussing Sarah's book, and it's become a source of wisdom and inspiration for the group. Sarah Augustine is the executive director of the Coalition to Dismantle Adoption Discovery, a national coalition with global reach. From 2007 to 2022, she directed a dispute resolution center in central Washington. She has served on the faculty of Heritage University, Central Washington University, and Yakima Valley College, and has served as adjunct faculty at Goshen College. Sarah also served as the chair of the Washington State Redistricting Commission in 2021-2022, shepherding the largest group outreach effort in Washington history and establishing a tribal consultation policy. She was appointed by the Washington State Supreme Court to the Office of Civil Legal Aid Oversight Committee in 2018, where she served for five years. At the invitation of the Supreme Court, she convened a working group to review the appellate rules for indigent residents. Sarah has written for Sojourners, Anabaptist Witness, Gee's Magazine, The Mennonite, Response Magazine, and Leader Magazine, and she is a regular columnist for Anabaptist World. With Coalition co-founder Sherry Hosteller, she co-hosts the Dismantling the Doctrine Discovering podcast. And of course, Sarah is the author of The Land is Not Empty, which was published in 2021 by Herald Press. So we welcome Sarah Augustine tonight to the CTA community. Thank you, Lauren. <clears throat> it's such a pleasure to be here um, with you all. Um, thank you for making me welcome. And I am going to open by just talking a little bit about introducing myself and then talking about the doctrine of discovery and what it is and, and what brought me to this work. And so um, I am, I consider myself to be racially, I'm an indigenous woman. And politically, I refer to myself as a displaced person which is to say that my family um, it is not affiliated with um, the tribe that we're genetically related to because of child displacement, because my father was removed from his family and his land and his people and culture at birth in 1943. And so like a lot of indigenous people in the United States, um, I am a displaced person. And so, um, and that has some complications that go along with it. But um, I am from the lands that are now known as Northern New Mexico. And I grew up in Albuquerque, but I live among the Yakima people in central Washington. So I live on the homeland of the Confederated Bands and Tribes of the Yakima Nation, which is the Yakima Indian Reservation. And I have lived there as a neighbor and a guest for 18 years. And I wanna acknowledge um, the elders and the people of that land that have shepherded it and its sacred waters for untold generations. I'm really proud to be able to, to live there and be part of that community. I started working with indigenous peoples um, in 2004 when I found myself on an international team um, that was working on resource extraction or gold mining in the Guiana Shield of South America. And it was really through that experience of working together with indigenous people struggling for their survival that I started to learn about my own story and my own experience as an indigenous woman. So in, from my point of view in the United States, um, Assimilation was really the, the pathway that was available to me. 
um, I didn't really feel like I had the option or the ability to, to do something else. Assimilation was the one pathway. And the challenge with assimilating when you are a person of color in this country is that the body that you're walking around in defines your status regardless of what you believe or say or do. And so um, living with um, racial discrimination, especially um, having grown up in the underclass, um, was, it was a really challenging experience. And so one of the things that I wanted to do is to um, get the, the best education I could as the first person in my family to graduate from college, certainly the first person to graduate from graduate school, and sort of planned on just assimilating um, the best way that I could. And so my thought was that if I could, if I could sort of grab the brass ring, that I would not have to deal with, with racism anymore or discrimination. And I would be able to sort of enter, you know, the mainstream. And what really, for me, I think that just meant not to be treated disrespectfully or live with humiliation, you know, on a daily basis. And in, in entering into relationship with indigenous peoples who, who did not have rights, still continue to not have land rights. In um, the Guiana Shield of South America, um, I was just sort of, you know, flummoxed by that experience because I could not understand how people who had lived on the same lands for generations and generations, you know, from their point of view, really from the beginning of time, how they could not have land rights. And so um, <clears throat> to put that another way, their national government has the ability to, um, to form relationships or, or give conces concessions to um, extractive industry, in this case, mining. <laughs> so indigenous people can find themselves in a situation where their lands are polluted. They don't have access to anywhere else. And they're just living in a situation where their lives are at risk. <laughs> Excuse me. And I could not understand how that, how that could happen. Like, it just made no sense to me. How can that happen? And that's how I really discovered what the doctrine of discovery is. Because I kept digging down and down and trying to figure out, how can this be legal? It just feels like it can't be legal. And actually, it is legal um, as a matter of international law for a colonizing power to establish who has the right to own and improve land or to develop land and who does not. And so um, based on papal bulls at its origin, the doctrine of discovery is really based on papal bulls that were, that were written in um, the 1400s that really established that European powers are going to be able to own um, the lands in South America and Central America and North America. And that those people that lived in those lands would not have um, would not have rights. In fact, um, in the um, in the um, in the Rex Pontifex, it really says um, that the the sovereign, the European um, a monarch, would be empowered to to put those people into a state of perpetual slavery. So it's it's really written into what we understand as the first international law that the European power that first discovers the land or has the technology to, to move on to the land will get to determine everything that's going to happen with those lands. This is really the basis of international law and then um, domestic law in, in most of the discovered world. So certainly in North and South America, Central America, the Pacific, New Zealand, Australia, um, countries in Africa, and some parts of Asia, this is just sort of the basic logic um, of how uh, land tenure works. And so, you know, I found myself in this horrifying situation where I'm working with indigenous peoples who don't have land rights and their, their health is being stripped away from them at the same time that, um, uh, that people from foreign countries are coming in and, um, and removing them from their lands, taking their lands away with land grabbing and uh, just sort of a horrific, process of colonization. So I started to dig down into this and realize that the doctrine of discovery was, was the reason. And it was through that process that I started to understand my own story. So in my own mind, I thought that um, the reason that I grew up the way that I did in a violent and chaotic environment 
was because I had I was raised by dysfunctional parents. So there was so, some sort of character failing on the part of my mother and father. And through this, this journey of accompanying indigenous people in South America, I started to realize, wow, okay, they're the products of the most powerful country on earth, um, having um, domestic policy centered around removing indigenous peoples from their lands and taking um, away all of, of their land. So, so, so indigenous, the removal of indigenous people has been the policy of the United States since its formation and remains the policy to this very day. And so um, we went through a variety of policy eras in the United States, starting with extermination, moving uh, to um, removal and then termination and um, an entire um, hundred years plus of child removal being the primary um, way that indigenous people are, are removed from their lands. Um, many of you probably know that there are more indigenous children in foster care today than there ever were in boarding schools. So child removal remains the primary mechanism of removing indigenous peoples from their lands. And so my parents were, were caught up in this. And so, you know, when my father was removed from his mother at birth, um, he ceased to be a Native American in the eyes of the law, you know, because he was not enrolled. So his children, therefore, are also, you know, not Native American, which is fine, except that if you're walking around in a brown or a black body, um, that doesn't mean that you kind of are barred or not really able to assimilate because you're still going to be judged um, according to being from a racial minority and deal with the, with the institutional discrimination that that holds with it. And so, um, yeah, so, so I began to learn about this process and how, how this process of domestic policy has really been centered around gaining all of the land possible by removing indigenous people from it. And so, um, you know, it's estimated that at the time that Europeans had the technology to, to come to this continent in mass, there were 100 million people here in North America, 100 million people that lived here at that time. And so today in the United States, there are 6 million indigenous people. That's actually um, a generous estimate. They say between three and 6 million at the time of the last census. So you can see that that is quite a small number when compared with the 100 million that were here originally. And so for, from my point of view, that it became a you know primary focus for me to um, embrace that identity as an indigenous woman and to recruit people of faith to stand with indigenous peoples in a liberative stance as a matter of faith, as a matter of faith. So the Christian church um, created the doctrine of discovery and the onus is now on the Christian church to dismantle it um, in the name of Christ. So um, that's that's my brief introduction, and I'll just leave it there. We'd love to hear your comments and questions and reflections. Okay, since Sarah would like this to be a conversation, Lauren is going to get it going, and then we would invite you to use the reactions button at the bottom of the screen. If you move your cursor to either the bottom or top of your screen, you'll see a little smiley face with a plus. And if you click on that, there's a an emoji for you to raise your hand. So after Lauren and Sarah kick off the conversation, we invite you to raise your hand and comment or question as you feel led. Thank you, Donna. Yes, we'll start with this first question. And by the way, the questions that we have tonight were developed by members of the Indigenous Solidarity Collective. Again, I thank them for their work. Um, so I figure since the doctrine of discovery or is now, it's always relevant, but it's especially relevant because in March, the Vatican did repudiate the doctrine of discovery, right? But it's only just really the first step. Um, so we want to know what is your reaction to the repudiation of the doctrine of discovery? Maybe we'll just start there with that first question. Sure. So um, to me, um, this was just amazing news. It's not something I ever thought I would live to see in my lifetime. 
um, indigenous activists have been petitioning the Vatican for decades to consider repudiating the doctrine of discovery. So, um, so in, I think that it was just an amazing first small step. So, um, so one thing I want to say about that is, you know, there were sort of six points in the repudiation, um, and uh, one of those points said really clearly that the doctrine of discovery, which had never been a doctrine of the church, was um, a misinterpretation that was manipulated and used by um, by European states to push their own political advantage. And I think that's not exactly accurate. <laughs> <laughs> because um, in Dumb Diversus, for example, um, the Pope was writing that um, that papal bull says that he is transferring the, the title of this land um, to uh, a European sovereign, um, which is actually the king of Spain in the name of God. So I would say um, that it's kind of hard to believe that that's a misinterpretation and also instructs that um, that uh, that Christian ruler to um, to enslave indigenous peoples and put them in a position of perpetual servitude. So I think that's also something that's hard to misinterpret. So 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 that's a, a small criticism or um, one that I would say, you know, I'd like I think feel like it would be good to to reimagine that a little bit, but I, but I don't feel a strong critique be just because I'm just so glad that this has happened. And that there is the, the willingness to take responsibility. And I, um, I want to applaud the Vatican for that willingness to take responsibility. And um, I also want to say that it gives a great opportunity for Catholics, especially Catholic activists to start asking for repair. And, um, and repair, from my point of view, um, is land return. And um, people ask me, well, Sarah, what do you mean by that? Because, you know, there are 330 million of us living in the United States today. Yes, that's true. And, and it, obviously, all of the land is not going to be returned to 6 million people. And um, it so happens that the, that the single largest private landowner on earth is the Catholic Church. There is uh, more private land owned by the Catholic Church than any other entity. And so there is an opportunity to discern how to, um, how to engage in land return in a good way. So that's my, my review. You said many things, <laughs> so I'm trying to <laughs> put it all together, but both with um, the land return and also that you know, there was, I think, a lot of comments um, after the repudiation of what does it mean? Is it a big deal? Like, should we celebrate it? So I appreciate your comments that, you know, celebrate that it happened, but it's just like the first step. And so I guess a follow-up question would be, what do you envision as the next stage of advocacy and activism? I think you touched on it, the land return. Uh, and so, and land return, I think there's just this great opportunity for Catholic activists and Christian activists now, um, because, just simply because the Catholic Church is in possession of so much land, this is really a great opportunity to start asking for a dialogue for how to return that land in a good way. And I want to say not just land return, but also land repair, land repair and land return. And, um, and, and the other big thing I think that we can talk about is honoring the sovereignty of indigenous peoples by joining with indigenous people's movements. So um, from my point of view, this means working with indigenous peoples, um, tribes, but also community groups and communities on the ground who are seeking self-determination and joining those movements. So um, for example, I can give some examples. Um, the Stronghold Apache are, are leading the way to resist um, the Rio Tinto copper mine that's going in near Tucson, that's going to create a crater in the Arizona desert um, at a sacred site that is two miles across and 10 stories deep, will um, be detrimental to the aquifer and will take um, tens of billions of gallons from the Colorado River just to get that ore to the surface. And so that is a, a movement of indigenous people, 
people to resist that mind and we can join together with that with indigenous people in that movement also i'm thinking of the um the makoche ikikupi that is the dakota land return project in minnesota um, following the leadership of indigenous people there who are seeking land return and there are christians who are accompanying them in that and um Right now, we have the Indian Child Welfare Act that's being challenged in the Supreme Court, um, presumably um, by Christians. And so uh, Christian people can join indigenous tribes across the nation in um, seeking to uphold the Indian Child Welfare Act in our states and continuing to work for um, national legislation that, that could um, counteract a Supreme Court decision should that occur. So, you know, joining the movements of indigenous peoples is possible and important. I want to say not only possible and important, but vital. And I think um, in the in the in the in the generation we are we are in now where we are facing climate change more than ever before, we need to join with indigenous peoples who are interfacing with the with the earth itself in a different way than the mm. systems of the dominant culture. Thank you. We have three people with their hands raised. So we've decided to go to them before asking another pre-prepared question. So we'll go Matthew, then Rosa, then Brenna. So Matthew, unmute yourself and ask away. Awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Sarah, for taking this time to speak with us. Um, my question is because I'm not necessarily, I'm not new to indigenous struggle uh, in the Americas uh, in terms of a historical perspective, but I am very new to it in terms of my Catholic roots and all of that. Um, what would be, um, other than your book, which I've already uh, put on my list of stuff to order, uh, what other readings would you recommend for people uh, who are new to this and looking to get as much knowledge as they can on the subject? Thank you. So I have two that I'm maybe three that I need to um, to highlight. Um, two of them by secular writers and another Christian writer. So the first would be Bob Miller, <clears throat> Robert Miller's book. He's a legal scholar, probably the most predominant um, legal 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 scholar in the world on the doctrine of discovery. And his book is Native America Discovered and Conquered. Oh no, it isn't. Yeah, it is. Native America Discovered and Conquered. I, um, I get confused uh, between his book, which uh, that book, I have to tell you, is, is so referenced and cross-referenced for me. Um, it's just got tabs and so many underlines that I probably need to buy a new one. Um, he's at um, Arizona State University, wonderful guy, uh, worked with him for years, just a fabulous person. And uh, his book is really important. The other one would be um, Steve Newcomb. He is a historian, um, and both of these are indigenous men. Steve Newcomb's book is called um, A Stranger in the Promised Land. Um, so good. Um, really important book, too. Same, I've read just so much of, um, read that book again and again and referred to it. He also made a movie called The Domination Code, which is a really, really important movie that talks about how Christianity has, an, has created and enforced um, a structure of domination and a stance of domination towards indigenous people. Because we have to remember that the, the doctrine of discovery is not a historical event. It is a policy stance in the United States upon which hundreds of laws are based. So the doctrine of discovery um, was enshrined in our legal canon in 1823. That is 200 years ago this year. and and many, many, many um, hundreds of laws are based on it. So it, it threads its way through every institution in our country. And so I, anyway, and then the third book that I would encourage you to consider um, is um, by um, Mark Charles. And oh gosh, I'm going to blank on the name. He's a Christian um, uh, Protestant writer. And Mark Charles' book is... Um, Oh, I'm so sorry. It'll come to me in just a minute. As soon as I don't need to say it, but um, it has the word truths in it. I forget what. We'll look it up for you. 
Yeah, <laughs> that would thank you. I appreciate that. Perfect. And and now we go to Rosa. Hi. Good evening, Sarah. Um, you've already touched on what I'm going to ask, and I put the question in the chat, and and I was hoping for a little elaboration on on the differences between reconciliation, restitution, and reparation. And you know, I think of all of these words, and I think when it comes down to it, um, you know, even as a child, if we did something that was not right, it wasn't enough just to say I'm sorry. And it seems in the, this culture, we're supposed to say I'm sorry and write a check. And I was raised, no, you make it right. You broke it, you fix it. You, you give it back the way you got it. Um, and, and so I'm wondering about that. And also um, the intersection of, you know, the, the desecration of the earth, speciesism and um, racism and all the rest. And, and it makes me think if we go back to the way it was, and acknowledge, for instance, unceded land, it gives us new questions, which I think are humane questions. Just who has the right to say who is on this land? Who has the right to say who's quote, illegal and who isn't? And who can cross imaginary borders and who cannot? Because at this time, I really don't think it's the people who are putting up the fences. I think it's, uh, it's all of the indigenous people. This belongs to the indigenous people. Yeah, so I, that, what, so you you said quite a lot there, Rosa, and I'm going to try and pick out a few of those questions to answer. One of them I want to talk about is um, <clears throat> the reality as it's sort of taught to us by the dominant culture. What is reality? And so um, from what I have learned over the years um, from indigenous elders that have been, had the, the kindness and patience to sit with me and teach me is that reality with a capital R is that we live in a closed system of mutual dependence. So closed system means no new water, no new air, no new soil. What we have in the earth, um, this is it. And we, we, um, we are mutually dependent in that what we do affects everybody else around us and all life, not just humans, but the four-legged and the winged ones and um, the standing green nation, which is all the plants that we depend on for life. And I also want to um, uh, talk about the invisible ones, which is the, the microorganisms in the soil. And uh, in Western science, we have not even cataloged 10% of those microorganisms yet, which is to say we don't really know how soil works. And yet we depend on it to live. And so that's reality with a capital R. That's what elders have taught me. We are mutually dependent in a closed system. And the reality of the dominant culture says, you have to take care of yourself um, to the detriment of all others, that we are in a competition for scarce resources. And so what we do is um, I need to amass as much wealth and power as I possibly can in my lifetime. And that is gonna give me safety and security and then ensure the safety and security of my heirs. So I want to make the biggest splash I can through accumulation. And that has created systems of death that run counter to systems of life. And so those systems of death follow an extractive and a colonial logic. They, um, they enforce power over or domination. And that has gotten us into a situation in just 70 years where we are breaking the world. We now are, humanity is like a geophysical force upon the earth to the point where we're changing the weather. We are changing the climate, and that, um, that is a system of thinking, a colonial system of thinking that is causing massive destruction where every life support system on earth is in decline. And so responding to that in a good way requires us to engage in a logic that many of us don't even know how to begin to engage, and that is with indigenous peoples and their cosmologies, those peoples who know how to live on this earth and have done so for generations of time. And so um, I wanna talk about what you said originally about reconciliation and repair and so on, and say that you know to seek reconciliation as a church 
It's very hard to do that when we've never had conciliation. So reconciliation assumes we were in right relations and then something went wrong. Um, and that's just not the case. We have to seek conciliation with indigenous peoples, which is to say right relations um, for the first time. And in order for us to do that as the church, we must seek repair. And in order to seek repair, that requires the people in a relationship of power imbalance, those people who are benefiting from that power imbalance to give up power. And that requires repair. And so many indigenous peoples in the United States and around the world are asking for the repair in the form of land return. Land repair and land return. And so repair, so the process of repair is number one, acknowledging wrongdoing. And so this statement from the Vatican is the beginning of that, acknowledgement of wrongdoing, so important. Step two is to seek repair. What would repair look like? If my child comes into my room to borrow something from me and smashes my you know, crystal vase, saying, sorry, it does not repair the vase. We're maybe not gonna be able to glue the vase back together again, but we have to figure out repair. What will we do um, to, to right the wrong? And then the third thing, and only after we have sought repair, do we seek forgiveness. We have to do repair before we seek, um, before we apologize and seek forgiveness. Anything other than that is asking the most vulnerable party to give us something, which is forgiveness. And that is absolutely inappropriate. Um, so, so Rosa, I am, tried to answer a couple of your questions or I think I got at least partway through. Thank you so much, Sarah. We have a, a couple of questions in the chat that were um, about land return. So I'm going to try to combine them. And you already touched on it a bit. Um, but some were wondering what, recommend, what recommendations uh, can you make to the Catholic Church? when it comes to land return. And then I guess part two would be, so we have some people who are positive, some people a little, I think, pessimistic. <laughs> that said, since land return seems unlikely anytime soon, would it be another way to make reparations? Yeah, I don't think land return is unlikely at all. I think it's very likely. I think it's already happening in some places. And so I think what we have to do is follow, um, engage in relationship, relationship building, to find out how to do that in a good way in a variety of different contexts. So it's never gonna happen that we're gonna give the whole thing back in mass, right? But you know, the Catholic Church owns a lot of private land and can be in discussion, especially as that private land um, is available. That is to say, as it's being unused, as it's sitting fallow, to begin this process of dialogue with indigenous people adjacent to that land and working out a process of re repairing and returning that land to the control of indigenous peoples. Because for indigenous peoples, decolonization is rooted in land and repair is rooted in land. So returning land, it doesn't have to be all of it. Um, and it's going to take collaboration over time. Actually, I see that uh, Brenna is here from Nuns and Nuns and she could probably talk with us um, in detail about um, about how nuns and nuns is really approaching what nuns and nuns is first of all many of you may know but how nuns and nuns is is approaching land repair and return yeah should we go to Brenna sure thanks I was next on the hand raising docket anyways thanks Sarah thanks so much um for this webinar, I'm, I was really grateful to hear about it today. And Ann Pratt, who's on the call, forwarded it to me, and I was like, I have to listen. Um, yeah, I'll. Sorry, you just were muted somehow, Brenna. All right, there I am again. I put our Nuns and Nuns Land Justice website in the chat. So our our programs are available to anybody, and we have a lot of webinar programs that highlight case studies of examples of land return to both indigenous and black people, both of who both communities have had land stolen from them, obviously first and primarily indigenous communities, but it's been across both. Um, so we've highlighted examples of where that land repair and return is happening. We also um, 
have, there's a really great recording of a uh, workshop by the Center for Ethical Land Transition who helps um, people who are interested in returning land in or transferring land in an ethical way to Black and Indigenous communities, how to do that well, because there's ways um, those of us who are particularly white landowners who uh, have a lot of blind spots and have can can go through that process in a really poorly. So we also have workshops on our website for how to think about doing it well and respectfully. Um, so so anyone can attend any of these programs. We also are working, walking with seven focused communities of religious, women religious, religious sisters who are currently discerning um, what they're going, th who hold land and property, and in sometime in the next 10, 20 years are making very concrete decisions about what's gonna happen to this land and property. And so we're particularly working with women religious um, who we think are, really kind of the lights in many ways of our Catholic church, uh, especially in the United States. They're kind of, they hold a lot of moral authority where the rest of the church often does not. So we're excited to work with them. Um, uh, some of whom I see on this call. Um, I also just wanted to briefly mention today a big, um, a big thing happened in, in my other world that um, I'm part of a group of people who's been working on um, making accessible um, information to survivors and descendants of Catholic boarding schools, which boarding schools that were run by the Catholic church. Um, and so that second website that I just put in the chat is the, today is the first day that this, this website is made public. We put out some press releases. So it's CTAH stands for Catholics for Truth and Healing. This is as full and complete of a list that currently exists. It will definitely be updated of all Catholic operated native boarding schools that existed in the United States. What's different about this list is it also gives um, the lists of dioceses and religious communities that were involved in each school. And so I really encourage you if, you, if you live in one of these dioceses, if you're part of one of these communities or know people who are, are please, please, please encourage them to, um, reach out to the tribal nations who their schools impacted and begin to work with those tribal nations on figuring out the best way to make those archives accessible to the survivors and descendants of those schools. Um, that's a huge request that has been put to us for um, healing. And this is the first time this list has made, been made public. So that's a, um, it's going to be a really helpful tool, we hope. Um, yeah, thanks, Sarah. And I have more to say, but I'm not going to because there's, I want to give other people chances. Thanks. And Sarah has so many good things to say. Thank you. Oh, Sarah. I know I, a question that I had, Sarah, was oh, can sure. you talk about what you're doing as the Mennonite church to dismantle the doctrine of discovery? What are you, that we could like take lessons as Catholics from you all? Sure. So I happen to be a Mennonite um, uh, by, as a matter of faith and uh, myself and two other Mennonite women um, the three of us together formed a coalition to dismantle the doctrine of discovery. And so we formed this, um, this coalition that is um, not sponsored or funded by any church body and is actually an ecumenical um, organization. And so there are people from various different faith walks who participate and are part of it. <clears throat> and we work on um, dismantling the doctrine of discovery and to us, that means two things. One is um, policy change, changing laws and policies um, that are oppressive and challenging those. And then, um, and that leads to, um, to structural change. And the other is working on changing the culture. So, because we understand that we can't change laws and policies without changing the culture, and we can't change the culture without changing laws and policies. So we do all of that all at once. Um, and I would uh, I would love for you to check out our website, um, which was put in the chat. I think it's just the beginning of our time together. Um, and so um, we do a variety of different things. In addition to structural work, we um, we had a working group who produced a play and that toured across the United States and Canada. Um, we have a working group that is producing music for the movement. Um, we have a working group that's producing a board game 
Um, of course, we create all kinds of materials, including a documentary film on what the doctrine of discovery is and study guides. We have a, a guide on seeking repair, um, a guide on land acknowledgements, a variety of different educational resources for, um, for Christians um, to utilize. And then we form um, collaboration with indigenous uh, communities that are seeking self-determination. We provide them um, with all the, the support that we have to offer. So um, we have a repair partner each year and we provide them, um, our coalition 60% of, of general donations go directly to our repair partner and with the other 40% we run our coalition. And so um, we are committed to the movements of indigenous peoples, those movements that are for self-determination and for dismantling systems of oppression. So please check us out. We also have a podcast. It's called the Dismantling the Doctrine of Discovery podcast. You can find us on any platform. Um, and we, my, my, my co-host, um, Sherry Hostetler, and I also are in the process of publishing another book. And that book is called um, So That We and Our Children May Live, Following Jesus and Resisting the Climate Crisis. So it's about ecological, ecological overshoot and how we position ourselves as the church um, to stand in solidarity with the earth and with indigenous peoples. I think we're gonna go, because we have Joanne waiting. So before I ask any more about your coalition, which we could talk more about. I would like to go to Joanne because she's been waiting patiently. Mute. <laughs> Let's see. Okay, there you are, Joanne. Okay. I, I'm trying to figure out how to unmute. Oh, no, we can hear you. You're good. Okay. Um, uh, th thanks, Sarah. I appreciated the... Uh, both the policy and the big picture of what you had to say was very important. I have one, one question I'd like to ask, which is I found many non-Native people don't have close relationships with Native people as friends in their life, people that they listen to and do things with, and yet, it seems like when I have a close relationship with someone and listen to them about their lives, that's the place that I learn to care about people and it motivates me around policy. So I'm wondering what you might have to say to non-Native people about forming, relation, forming real friendships with Native people in their lives, not occasionally, but as real close relationships. So Joanne, I'm gonna do my best to address your comments and I'm gonna ask for you to extend grace to me as I attempt to do that. Um, <clears throat> because maybe what I have to say won't be exactly what you're, what you're thinking I might say. So, um, the first thing I want to say is that there are only 6 million indigenous people in the United States. There are 330 million of us in the United States. Only 6 million of us are indigenous. So not, not very many in the total population, right? They say between one and 2%. And so it's really hard for everybody in the dominant culture to know someone personally who's indigenous because there aren't very many indigenous people. Um, many indigenous people not many, all indigenous people are facing the consequences of real oppression. It's not abstract and distant. It is ongoing harm today. So when I say that, Joanne, what I mean is that many, many indigenous people, most indigenous people are living under the poverty level because the majority of our wealth has been stripped away from us. And because many of us were removed from our lands and people and relatives. And so we're dealing with the, the, the process of just breathing in and breathing out every day in a country with structural inequality and true and meaningful oppression. 
So folks that are in the upper middle class and in the professional classes do not interact with us very much because most of us are in the underclass. And so it's really hard to imagine how we're going to cross paths. And those, those people um, who are living in the underclass and who happen to be indigenous in the United States do not really have time to go to potlucks or to help white people learn how to be full human beings. It's taken up all their time and effort to pay their bills and get their kids to where their kids need to be and to just survive. So I think the idea that somehow we're gonna we're going to deal with racial oppression by getting to know indigenous people on an interpersonal level is an unrealistic expectation. And it is imposing an expectation on the victims of oppression that is probably unrealistic. Um, especially I think as it as it um, as it is encouraged, it places it places a burden on many indigenous people who don't know how to do that or, or necessarily want to do that. So so I'm gonna I'm gonna go through some statistics here and say that indigenous peoples um, are overrepresented in the criminal justice system. In fact, in states where indigenous peoples predominantly live, they are the most overrepresented, more than African-Americans. That um, Native American people are the least likely to own a home. We are the lowest number in home ownership. That indigenous people are the least likely to graduate from high school. We have the lowest graduation rate. That indigenous people, indigenous women are the most likely to die in childbirth that our children are the most likely to die in the first three years of life. Um, this is in part because indigenous women in the 1970s, especially, especially one in four of us was sterilized involuntarily. So we don't have a high degree of trust in the, in the medical system. Um, so what I'm saying to you is that when you're dealing with a population that is seriously facing structural oppression, it's hard to imagine how they're going to connect with each other. So I'm going to say this too, respectfully. During the, the movement to oppose apartheid, you did not need to be in personal relationship with a Black South African to know that apartheid was wrong. You don't have to be in relationship with an Indigenous person to know that the doctrine of discovery is wrong. It's wrong, and it's going to take the power and the privilege and the influence of white people to dismantle it. And white people have to choose to dismantle it whether or not you have a personal relationship with an indigenous person. And those words I just spoke are hard to hear. And I know that. So I thank you for the grace you extend me in hearing me. Thank you so much, Sarah. I think to follow up with that, and that is, um, a lot of the questions that the Indigenous Solidarity Collective came up with and also has been discerning for like the last year. I mean, that's a very new working group. And part of the discernment was how do we do this work when we don't have anyone on staff at Call to Action who's Indigenous? Uh, not many Call to Action members are Indigenous. Um, do we reach out to Indigenous Catholics, indig Indigenous Christians? Um, and so I guess to follow up, we're wondering then both maybe on a personal level, but also as an organizational level, what should allies be aware of not to do? Uh, what do you think you already touched on? Um, and what, so maybe talk about what, what we should be aware of not to do, um, and then how we can then maybe further, further define our role as allies. Does that makes sense. Yeah. It does, thank you. I appreciate that. And so one of the things that is so powerful and so important that all Christians can do is to join indigenous people in the movements of indigenous people. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. We can join indigenous people today who are struggling for their own self-determination in their own movements. So I want to ask you to consider joining the stronghold Apache in their bid to um, save Oak Flat. To that end, our coalition, the Coalition to Dismantle the Doctrine of Discovery, um, is working on a legislative campaign across the nation. We are lobbying the Senate to, um, to put forth legislation counteracting the congressional legislation that led us to this land transfer in the first place. 
so you can participate in that legislative campaign. We would welcome participation in that on the coalition. Our coalition is almost, uh, I shouldn't say that anymore, but primarily white Christians. And, and thank God for these white Christians who are willing to join with indigenous peoples and their movements for structural change. And by structural change, I mean changing laws and policies. And um, the struggle at Oak Flat is not the only one. There is a struggle to uphold the Indian Child Welfare Act. Um, and there are indigenous led struggles across the nation, especially over land and land resources. And it's possible for your parish or congregation to join with indigenous peoples locally by, you can look um, at, at during your next legislative session at, bills that come out and see which bills are being supported by the tribe in your area, for those of you who live near Native American tribes, and support those interests of those tribal leaders. Um, and I, I can't overemphasize how important it is to join with Indigenous peoples who are struggling for their own self-determination. So for example, the folks in Nevada, who are resisting lithium extraction and extractive industry. In the state where I live, in Washington state, those indigenous peoples that are working for the sovereignty of water in a state where hydropower, which displaces indigenous people, is so um, widely embraced. In New Mexico, my home territory, joining with the Tewa Women United, those women who are seeking to resist uh, the impact of nuclear power on our tribal land. Um, I just wanna encourage you, join indigenous people's movements. And you also asked me, um, Lauren, what do we want to be careful of? One thing that is really important to be um, careful of as you're beginning the, the, the relationship with indigenous peoples and struggling with them in their movement, is to be really mindful of your own needs and how to meet your own needs rather than impose those on the needs of the, impose them on a vulnerable community or indigenous community. So all people who, um, who go into um, it with a stance of helping an oppressed group, all of us that do that are going into that posture to meet a need of our own. And that's okay. That's a very human thing to need, to need. Do we need recognition? Do we need to be thanked? Do we need to, um, to show our community that we are in a position uh, that we're a good person? Whatever that is, it's important for us in the church to meet those needs ourselves, figure out how within our own community we're going to meet those needs for each other instead of imposing that onto Indigenous people. Um, and I think that's really important, not just for indigenous people, for all people of color. Um, we, we, what we don't wanna do is get into a situation where we're asking, where, where we are reinforcing power imbalance by saying, you know, we're giving you this help and support. And therefore we expect that you are going to, um, to voice thanks to us or lift us up in some way. I think we can just choose to lift up vulnerable groups without asking for anything in return. And another thing that I think is really important is when we are sharing resources, money and time and so on, to acknowledge and accept the leadership of that community, that we're not gonna micromanage what people do with the money that we give them, that we're not going to micromanage um, indigenous people's movements or say, hey, I have a lot of experience and talent. You should let me take over this thing. Um, it's, it's, we really wanna come with a posture of humility and acknowledge you are the world expert in your own context. And I want to learn about that context and provide you all the support that I bring. I would say those two things are really important. And Lauren, I want to just applaud your indigenous solidarity group and the fact that you are not, that there's, there isn't an, an indigenous person on that solidarity group is awesome because you are saving indigenous people the work of organizing your group. And that's a really important thing to be able to do. And if indigenous people come onto that group, eventually that's also terrific, but you're willing to do the work whether there is an indigenous person there or not. And I applaud that.
Thank you so much, Sarah. I hope the other members of the collective hear that today <laughs> and you know feel uplifted because that has been, like I said, one of the many concerns and part of like many discussions and disturbance over the past year. And so just to go along with uh, your great response, I had another question. Um, you know, when, when we're talking as the Indigenous Solidarity Collective, um, we sometimes I think feel like maybe we're not doing enough or, you know, we did things like we did the um, Advent calendar and the Lenten calendar for call to action this past year. Um, and it was great and it was beautiful. And I know our members really liked it. I'm also hyping us a little bit, but I know our members really enjoyed it. But I know some of us are also like, well, is this, um, you know, like, like, what is it doing, right? Because it's just like an advent calendar. It was getting the word out about the um, Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, right? So it was getting the word out about Indigenous reparations and, and justice and healing. But I think sometimes we feel like we're not doing enough. And so I wonder if you could talk a little more about some of your working groups at your coalition. Because I know, like you said, you had working groups that work on board games and music and a working group just to pray. And so maybe you could talk about how your coalition's working groups uh, kind of work to, um, you know, keep the movement movement going and that it doesn't always have to be both, it's not hierarchical and then also, you know, you're still doing something even if you're making a board game or you're praying. Yeah, so I'd love to talk about all of that. And <clears throat> the first thing I wanna say, Lauren, is that um, when we are opposing systems of death, this logic of colonization, this logic of extraction, individualism. Um, and when we're opposing those things, it feels so big and so strong, those systems. And so it's very easy for us to despair and to feel despair. And I want to submit to you this notion that the antidote to despair is understanding that you are not alone. Understanding that you are not alone, that we are together and we are more powerful together than we could ever be singly. And our action has to be collective. We have to work collectively and we can work collectively and that we are effective in working collectively. And so a, a bit about the coalition. We are a coalition of working groups and anyone can form a working group. Anyone who has the energy to do that. And we then call on others and say, hey, who else wants to be a part of this. We have a working group right now that's just called the Deep Reflection Working Group. These are people who want to reflect deeply and begin theological reflection. And, and this is also a group that writing comes out of because they're willing to, to reflect deeply. And so we have all manner of working groups um, who do a variety of things. We even have working groups that are in solidarity with indigenous peoples across in, in the world. So we have a Maya solidarity working group. We work with those people in the Yucatan Peninsula that are displaced as a result of land grabbing and economic development and, and others. And so um, anyone with the passion to, to do work and form a working group, and we will help get people and resources to that working group. And we are a very flat organization in that regard. We're a coalition of working groups. And we recognize that the, that the labor that all people are putting forth, it's all valuable and important. And the other thing I want to say about, you know, organizing and working together to resist systems of death is that there is only one side in this world. We say there are two sides. Oh, you know, there's, this is so big and so bad and we'll never be able to be successful. There's only one side, and that is the side of creation. Any other logic is doomed to fail. There is only the logic of life that is embedded and revealed within creation itself, the nature of the creator. And if you are submitting your life energy to working together with systems of life, then it is impossible to fail because there's only one chance for us on this planet, and that is to collaborate with systems of life the end, everything else is doomed. We may not see it in our generation and in our lifetime, and that's okay. We have to think about the long-term, we're investing now in systems that will bear fruit maybe a hundred years from now, and that's okay. We do that because it's the right thing to do because we're motivated by the spirit of life to do that. And so we don't wanna give in to despair. We wanna give what we have to give. 
We have a working group that is our prayer working group. Um, we have an activity every single month in the coalition that's called the Prayer in Action Hour. And in that Prayer in Action Hour, we pray together. And then we also do an action. So sometimes that's learning how to write a letter to the editor. That's what we did last month. Um, or you know, getting an update on the ICWA campaign, figuring out how to call a legislator, um, a variety of activities that we do in the Prayer in Action Hour. And that's just a chance for us to be together. But our prayer team is so important. They pray for us individually. They pray for the work of the movement, the indigenous people's movements that we are supporting and joining. And I have to tell you, as a leader in the coalition, I have felt the impact of those prayers. <clears throat> I have a chronic disease. I have multiple sclerosis. So health challenges are a constant challenge for me. I have to tell you, it's had such a big impact on my health to have these amazing women um, praying for me. And I have to say, we don't have any men yet on our prayer working group. So come on, men, we want you, we need you. But for now, it's women. And I'm so thankful for the prayers of these deeply holy women who are praying for our movement. And, you know, we have all kinds of women. So thankful for the people who are willing to give their life energy for justice. Uh, thank you for sharing that, Sarah. And yes, where are the men in that prayer group? Hmm. <laughs> we want you, we need you. Uh, that's another presentation, where are the men? <laughs> we'll save that. Rosa has been uh, waiting patiently, so we're gonna go to Rosa. Oh, I'm listening to you, Sarah. I feel like I can breathe. <laughs> um, in listening to you, I was, and I hear, and I can see, that there's a thought process there that I I have. I believe in planting seeds. I'm just one little person. There's, I figure not much I can do except plant a seed. Um, there's no win, there's no lose. Just plant the seed and keep planting them. And with that in, in mind, one of the seeds I've been thinking of lately, which is kind of weird because I live in the city in Los Angeles, which is huge is to start planting the seeds where I question when there's a development coming up, when there is something that deals with the land and boards are put upon, to ask people, and where is the voice of the Tongva here? Where is the voice on this board that's going to decide how tall this building is going to be? Where are they? When the decision is made how deep you're going to drill, where are they? when the decision to displace people that are there is made, where, where's the voice of the Tongva, who are the indigenous people here in Los Angeles? And I'm thinking, is that something that is useful to be doing as an ally along with everything else? Or is, am I being a little presumptuous? Well, <clears throat> I appreciate the question. I don't have a relationship with the Tongva um, myself, but I don't think it's ever a bad idea to ask and consult. I think that's always a good idea um, to, to consult with native tribes. And I always think, I think it's always a good idea to ask government structures, have you consulted with the tribes in your area? I think that's always a good idea. I don't know what those tribes will say. We, we have a great diversity of the cultures and understandings and interests across um, indigenous you know, America. And <clears throat> I wonder what it would be like if we said in the United States, we are not going to do any drilling unless the filter or the decision maker is the tribe that will be the most impacted by that drilling. We're not gonna give any leases, natural gas or oil leases without um, the input and even the consent of the native people um, that live in that area. And, and my question is, the impact would that have on, on climate change? How might that slow down the process of climate change if we just said, we are going to talk with the people who have um, shepherded and stewarded this land for the longest? What impact might that have? I mean, I think, I think consultation is so important. Of course, the UN Declaration on the rights of indigenous people, which is the international policy that was written by indigenous peoples, demands free prior and informed consent. 
before anything can happen, any economic development or otherwise can happen on indigenous people's lands. And of course, in North America, all of this land was indigenous people's lands at one time. So even if it is just, if we're just gonna do that for federally held land or for state land, consultation, oh my goodness, imagine how that might transform our country or our world just to engage in that consultation. So it's a good thought, I love that Rosa. Hey, thank you, a little seed. Okay, thanks. Yes, thank you, Rosa. If anybody has any more questions, you can please place them in the chat or raise your hands. Oh, do have a hand. Oh, it's Jess. You're on, Jess. Hi. Um, hi, Sarah. This is so great to have you here. And my name is Jessica, and I'm part of the Indigenous Solidarity Collective. And I'm zooming in from the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and um, Squamish First Nations in Vancouver, BC, Canada. And my question is, my memory fails me, but in your book, I remember there was a part where um, you were saying something about having like corporate missionaries. And I really, that really like stuck with me. And I was like, what would that be like? <laughs> what does she mean by that? And and maybe it's like not necessarily a preventative measure. It's like already like I feel like um, engaging in policy is really preventative, like trying to get to the front of it. Whereas if we're already dealing with like an extraction company, it's like, OK, like they're already doing damage. But like, what can you just like talk a little bit more about maybe what you said, like what you think mm -hmm. what that would look like a corporate missionary? Thank you, Jessica. I so appreciate the question. And I want to tell you, it's not a metaphor. I really mean it. In the coalition, we're trying to figure out how to do this and how we will fund it. Um, and so I think we have, I think, I think we're making progress. So the idea of mission, from my point of view, is to reach out and resource people who are at risk of losing their immortal soul. That's the way it was taught to me. And I'm not Catholic, but you know, from the evangelical perspective, which is the kind of church I grew up in, it was like, we have to reach out to these people who, who don't have access to God <laughs> or the spirit of life. So the term I would use now. And so from my point of view, it is not indigenous people who need mission. It is the captains of industry that are moving the levers of extractive industry and decision making decision makers and economic development and etc that are making that happen they're removing indigenous peoples from lands and hastening the destruction of the life support systems of earth those people need the good news and i'm suggesting that we send missionaries to them I mean missionaries that are not short-term mission trips, but send families to preach the good news to these people whose souls are at risk because of the damaging activities they're involved in. And these families would go and learn the language and they would make friends and go to the picnics and um, share the good news over time with these people. And so I'm thinking instead of going to, um, to Indian country where a lot of missionaries go, let's go to Toronto. And, uh, you know, resource extraction happens in the United, I mean, Denver and Toronto, I mean, the biggest extractors on earth are in the United States and Canada. And so we could go to those places of corporate power. We could go to, we could send, we could send missionaries to Geneva to deal with with the G8 and say, hey, your economic policies are destroying the world. Why? Stop. Stop. We could do that. And I think I think we we will actually. I think we will do that. And um and I don't know how that what that long-term impact could be, but um I believe in the spirit of life. I do and I believe that spirit moves through us. It's and in the Christian tradition, we call that the Holy Spirit. And I believe in that spirit. I believe in that spirit. And I claim the power of that spirit that animates us and animates us towards justice. In the body of Christ, what that means is that we are moved and animated by that spirit to witness, to bear witness to the good news. And what is that good news? 
that Jesus proclaims in the fourth chapter of Luke. Uh, Jesus says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. And he says that's release for prisoners. It's sight for the blind. It is freedom for the oppressed. And it is the announcement of Jubilee. That is a just reordering of human systems. That's the good news. And that's the good news that we can bring to corporations that are bringing destruction and extraction to the world. Thank you for that. I just like had an image of like a group of us bringing a whole bunch of food, like having a talking circle with some like CEOs saying, hey, <laughs> this is what's going on. Okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> Oh man, that's so funny. I just pictured that too. I <laughs> just said it. That is such an interesting idea. I wonder how the Catholics on this call feel about <laughs> missionaries. <laughs> that is a very interesting idea. And you kind of answered, um, oops, I replaced the spotlight. Okay. You kind of answered um, a question I was going to ask. And of course, if anyone has any more questions, uh, please raise your hand up in the chat because we still have some time. Um, but I was thinking, and you kind of just answered it, but you know, since this call to action is a Catholic organization, you are Christian, Mennonite, um, and again, in, in our Indigenous Solidarity Collective, I think that's one thing we also had discerned and are still working through is acknowledging, well, of course, not the Catholic Church's role in colonialism, but, um, but also just, you know, do we reach out to Indigenous Catholics? or Christians, and then people were like, why are we just reaching out to indigenous Catholics and Christians, you know, and being very aware of our, of being Catholic, our Catholic identity, aware of our Christian identity, and so you kind of just touched on it, but I know, you know, many people are, are very skeptical, of maybe I think of working with Catholics or Christians, um, mm -hmm. especially on this, especially because, again, this does stem from the Catholic Church, mm -hmm. um, so you kind of touched it, but maybe if you uh, wanted to say a little more about you know, the importance of spreading the good news and using the gospel and how we could also use it, even though it has caused so much harm. It's like we're using, it's been manipulated and it caused so much harm and now we're using that to undo the harm. Mm -hmm. Yep, I very much believe in that, um, that we must undo the harm. And that, you know, I, I'll be honest with you, I'm a Christian, I'm an indigenous Christian. Some people ask me, it's one of the most, it's mo one of the most widely asked questions. How can you be a Christian and be indigenous? And the answer is because I love Jesus. <laughs> that probably sounds cheesy, but it's true because I actually, um, I actually um, believe in that message. I believe in that good news of Jesus, which is um, freedom for the oppressed. I do. I believe in that. And so um, I think it's a great idea to reach out to um, indigenous Catholics because that can ground folks in what movements are important from their point of view and joining those movements. Um, I think it's really important to, to have a posture of, uh, we want to consult with you and understand what your priorities are and what's important to you without asking you to do all the work because the people with the most resources need to do all the work. And um, indigenous Catholics, you could be in consultation with indigenous Catholics and, and determine how best to use um, the, the time and energy and resources that you have from their point of view. And um, I also think it's important to um, to show up in a good way, in a life-affirming way that draws us e each deeper into relationships. So as we, as folks from the dominant culture are engaging in relationship with indigenous people or with people um, who are experiencing oppression, our object is transformation. Transformation for ourselves, transformation for, um, for those who are dealing with oppression, transformation for our world. And, um, and that to me is learning how to be a human being, learning how to be fully human, because white supremacy uh, causes all of us to be dislocated from our humanity. 
are for humanity. And so there is healing for all people in engaging in right relationship. Right relationship, from my point of view, is relationship where power is balanced. And we cannot balance power with interpersonal um, relationship alone. We balance power structurally and collectively. As long as there are laws and policies that oppress one group of people, it's impossible to be in balanced power relationship, right? So we actually have to seek to impact those laws and policies that cause harm and oppression. And so we can seek that together. We can seek transformation together through mutuality, through joining together in familial relationship. That is to say, as equals and as co-searchers for justice. Um, because when we arrive at justice, it is healing for everyone, um, not just those people who are, um, who are in the position of being oppressed. So um, I'm thinking of white supremacy in particular is um, damaging to those people that benefit from it because they are prevented from embracing their full humanity when they are dislocated from um, from all people of color, right? So you can imagine how um, patriarchy is so damaging to men because under patriarchy, men, while the beneficiaries are punished for nurturing their children, they are punished for um, expressing the full range of their emotions, right? And so patriarchy is damaging to everyone including men and white supremacy is damaging to everyone. We have to collectively dismantle these systems of oppression so that we can all embrace um, our full humanity. And when I say humanity, I'm really talking about the human person, but we also just located from relationship, true and genuine relationship with the processes of life in creation. But we also need to um, engage with those processes because we are in a closed system of mutual dependence. So, so um, all of the creatures of earth are dependent on us and we dependent on them. Um, that is the nature of reality. And so um, by working together um, with the systems of life, by, by taking our cues from the systems of life, what we are doing is saving ourselves. I don't know if I fully answered you, Lauren. I feel like I kind of went off on a tangent there. Do you want to <laughs> get, get me back on, on track here? It's a beautiful tangent though. <laughs> uh, no, I think you did answer the question. Thank you. And this is the last chance for questions. So if anyone has a question, Chances now to raise your hands. I'm just gonna give it a little bit. Oh, we do have a hand. Okay. <laughs> Jane, you're on. Hi, Sarah. Thank you so much. And thank you very much to Call to Action for um, providing this important um, lesson, training, education. Um, I had put my question in the um, app, but in terms of trying to apply some of what you said in our own uh, geographical areas, Sarah, um, hypothetically, you know, what if uh, a local bishop decided to return a property to Native Americans? Then, how would that work? I, I assume that it wouldn't necessarily involve tearing down buildings that are being actively used like churches or schools. So would the diocese then start paying rent to the Native Americans or just if if we could make it really concrete with one example, um, that would help me a lot. So Jane, I believe that all repair has to be led by the injured party. So I can't tell you what that would look like. I think there would have to emerge dialogue between the diocese and that tribe or that community group or however that works, whatever that looks like. 
then that dialogue would help to craft what that would look like. And I think it would be different in every instance. That being said, I do want to say there are churches today, not just Catholic churches, all kinds of churches that are engaging in uh, in the rent um, movement. So, it, for example, in Seattle, where my home congregation is, there's the Duwamish have their real rent program, uh, but they're not the only ones. There are others that <clears throat> self-impose a tax um, on their land dealings when they buy land, when they sell land, when they lease land, when they rent land, um, they provide a percentage, uh, a tax that goes to the indigenous peoples that were displaced by their being there. And so um, those programs, I think, are also awesome because it's just direct funding to indigenous peoples as they are seeking self-determination in their own environment. So I, I want to give a shout out to that because I think that's really, really important. But I think when we're talking about land repatriation, I think that's going to be different in every case. And Jane, I would encourage you to go to the Nuns and Nuns website. <clears throat> and so that's N-U-N-S and N-O-N-E-S, Nuns and Nuns, because they have some really concrete examples of land transfer. And so we also, in our coalition to dismantle the doctrine of discovery, have some concrete um, land transfers also, where families and institutions have transferred land to indigenous peoples um, through dialogue that took a period of time. So the Dakota land recovery, Makoche Ikikupi, I was telling you about before, that is uh, an example of land recovery where um, Mennonite people simply said, we have this land and we want to return it. And that, that happened over time through dialogue. And so <clears throat> I think there is, that is confusing and also liberative in, in saying that, hey, this is a process to deepen relationship. Um, there is a church, actually a Methodist church that has approached me recently and said, we want to give this building back and the land that it's on, and we need help to figure out how to do that in the Yakima context. It's like, great, we're going to begin the process of discussing what that might look like, understanding it could take a while. What would that even mean? What would be required? I have no idea. It's not up to me, but I could open the hold the conversation. Thank you so much. Before, oh, sorry. Before Lauren wraps everything up and reminds you all to join our working group, um, I want to thank Sarah Augustine because as a Native person, here we are asking you to help us, and you generously came and gave of yourself. Um, while the whole time you're saying, don't ask Native peoples to do things because we do it all the time. So I just want to recognize that the work you're doing is difficult and you come from a place of victimization and hurt. And I just appreciate you being with us and helping us along our journey. You bet. I appreciate those words. And I also want to say thank you for showing up for my people. It's everything in the world that I care about. Everything in the world that I care about is showing up for my people. Um, across time and space, showing up for my family and the tribe that I'm from, but also the tribes in South America that have asked me to represent their interests. I wear this, it was given to me by a Lakono leader um, in Suriname, South America, and I wear it to remind myself that I don't speak for myself. I speak um, for indigenous peoples. And I want to thank you for being willing to give your life energy to that work, the thing that I care most about. Uh, thank you so much. That was so beautiful. And uh, thank you so much. Um, I want to thank Brenna from Nuns and Nuns for being here. And I was thinking, I was going to say, um, I think the next maybe presentation we do, a webinar should be with nuns and nuns. <laughs> I know some of our Indigenous Solidarity Collectives have been engaging with nuns and nuns uh, land justice project and attended like a recent webinar. And so I think that might be our next step. <laughs> so maybe we'll get in touch and plan that. Um, I guess just to wrap up, I know we're over time. And Sarah, I think you said enough. <laughs> but I was also wondering if there's like one or two things that you would like everyone here to maybe um, 
take with them or like an action step that they can do? It's like a very small action step. What would it be? You, each one of you are enough. Each one of you is called into the work and you are ready now. Um, please join us, whether you're going to join the Indigenous Working Group or join the coalition. Um, you don't need any special qualifications. Some of the people that are on our prayer team are disabled to the point where they can't even, they're homebound and they're praying for us. Um, each one of us has the ability to engage in this work today. Um, and I wanna thank you for your willingness. Um, come and join a working group in the coalition. We have two opportunities every month to just learn about what we do in the coalition. You can see our calendar on our website. And those are orientation, come to an orientation and learn how to join or come to our coffee hour. And you can just talk with me or one of our other staff about your ideas about what can do. Every, every month we have those two opportunities and I wanna encourage you. We want you, we need you, please join us. And I put in the chat links to uh, the coalition to this mail of doctrine discovery links to Sarah's book. Uh, we had links in there to joining the Indigenous Solidarity Collective, and I'll send that out tomorrow. So tomorrow I'll be sending out not only a recording of this presentation, but also all the links and hopefully all the resources that was discussed. And I'll see if Sarah has made some more resources that she'd like to pass along. I want to thank everyone again for being here. And again, thank you, Sarah. This was awesome. Hi, Chika. Arms Thank raised. Hi, Chika. <laughs>